Hello, I'm Professor Patrick McGorry. Welcome to today's webinar. Before we proceed, as Executive Director of Origin, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we work throughout Australia and pay our respect to Elders both past and present. Thanks for joining me today for this webinar on Alliance Processes and Engaging Young People. My name is Elon Gersh and I'm a clinical psychologist and clinical educator with Origin, the National Centre of Excellence in Youth Mental Health. And I'm really pleased to be here today to talk about these Alliance Processes, which I started researching during my PhD and I've extended and I'm really interested in exploring relational processes across a range of diagnostic groups and hopefully in a way that's useful for you today. So an overview of today, we're going to start with an explanation of why engagement is important. Then we're going to move to defining what I mean by the therapeutic alliance. We'll then talk about alliance rupture and repair as a process. And finally, give you some tools to manage the alliance process when it comes up in your own therapeutic treatments. So why is engagement important? As we see here, we've known for a long time that psychological therapies for youth achieve superior outcomes to natural recovery. We look at a recent review here and a figure from that, and we see the bars of positive effect sizes, the blue bars indicating positive effects following treatment, and the yellow bars indicating positive effects at follow-up. And what we see is that across a range of diagnostic groups, psychotherapies are effective with a small to medium effect size, and we can translate this using the idea of a number needed to treat. That is, how many patients do we need to treat to achieve an outcome where someone who, through natural processes, would have been defined as a treatment failure, comes to be defined as a treatment success. And for psychotherapy, the number needed to treat for youth is about three people. And this compares really favourably with other evidence-based interventions. For example, using aspirin as prophylaxis for a heart attack, the number needed to treat is 129 people. So psychotherapies work. In addition to this, a range of different psychotherapies work. There isn't only one effective model. And this has been called the so-called so -called Dodo Bird verdict. And this comes from a story from Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, where the Dodo Bird gets other characters to run a race and they run round and round in circles. And at the end, the Dodo Bird says, everyone has won and all must have prizes. And this Dodo Bird verdict has been applied to therapies where the evidence shows that really different therapies, so CBT, psychodynamic therapies, emotion-focused therapies, they all seem to achieve roughly comparable outcomes when they're applied in a way that's intended to succeed. And this has led many researchers and clinicians to wonder what are the kind of common mechanisms or factors that occur across these different treatments that might be driving therapeutic change. And the most promising kind of candidate in this regard is known as the therapy relationship. So we see here a figure from a review showing that in terms of change on the left, a lot of therapeutic change happens because of extra therapeutic factors, factors that happen outside of therapy sessions. But those that happen within the therapy, common factors that cut across different treatments, actually account for more change than specific techniques that apply within treatments. So for example, cognitive restructuring in CBT. And if we turn to the right here, in terms of variability in outcomes, so positive and negative outcomes, there's a lot of unexplained variance. We don't know why some people get better and some people get worse. We know that the patients contribute themselves a lot to what gets better and worse, so it's not within our control as clinicians. But what we can seem to control or contribute to, the therapy relationship seems to account for more variability than specific treatment methods that we're applying. So we have an opportunity to think really carefully about therapy relationships and how we can get the best outcomes for our clients. So in addition to us finding from research that therapy is important, therapists tell us that therapy is important. So when we survey clinicians, the most common area of research that impacts their work, they defined as research on the therapeutic alliance and ruptures in the therapeutic alliance. And this says that therapists value engagement, they think it's important. In addition, young people value engagement and they think it's important. So a recent qualitative study that looked at what young people want and asked them what they want from psychological services had the following quote. I'll read it out. 
Almost all participants spoke about the importance of having a good relationship with their counsellor. They seemed particularly to value aspects of the relationship that positioned their counsellor as a friend rather than as a professional and emphasised the importance they attributed to the genuineness, genuineness of this relationship. So young people view it as vitally important that they engage in a real relationship with their clinician. Finally, we know what a therapeutic relationship looks like when it's going well. So we see here a table from a review with personal attributes of therapists. They're flexible, they're honest, they're perceived as trustworthy and warm, and techniques that can be used to underlie this. And we know that when those things are happening, the therapeutic relationship is going well, and the young people are more likely to have a good recovery process. So let's take a step back and take these all together. We know that therapy works, we know that num a number of different therapies work, and we also know that the therapy relationship is a likely candidate as a fundamental driver of these therapeutic processes. We know that therapists value engagement, and we know that young people value engagement, and we know that it's going well. So clearly engagement is something really important that we need to offer our focus on. Let's talk about defining what the Alliance is as an aspect of engagement that's going to be important for our discussion today. The Alliance was initially developed in the psychodynamic literature, but was really defined by Borden in 1979 as a trans-theoretical concept, so a concept that cuts across different therapies. And fundamentally, as we see in the image on this slide, the Therapeutic Alliance is about a collaborative relationship. It's about the young person and the clinician working together collaboratively. And Borden defined three interrelated components of the Alliance. So the first is the bond. To what extent do the young person and the clinician like each other, trust each other, get along with each other? The second aspect is agreement on task. To what extent do the two parties agree on what activities make up the therapy hour? So what do we do when we meet together? And the third aspect is agreement on goals. To what extent do the clinician and the young person agree on what changes are being sought for therapy? What are we working on changing? The Therapeutic Alliance has been described as the quintessential integrative variable in that it cuts across all different types of treatments. And reviews have found from over 200 studies and over 14,000 people that a positive alliance, so a positive bond, agreement on tasks and goals, when that's positive, that's associated with a positive outcome and predicts a positive outcome across different treatments, across client ages, across different times of therapy when it's measured, across different measures being used, and across, finally, different people completing the measure, whether that's the young person, the clinician, or another observer. The correlation coefficient is about 0.28, indicating that it accounts, it accounts for about 8% of variability in outcomes. So it doesn't explain all variability in outcomes, but it's one of the leading candidates and compares favorably favorably to different other predictors of outcomes. So what does the advice mean for you? That means you should establish and maintain a good alliance with all young people at all times. Now is this advice useful? Well yes to some extent. It's useful to know that the therapy relationship is important. It's important to focus on it. But it's hard advice to maintain that at all times and it's insufficient. The reason why it's hard is because young people come to us with a lot of complexities. They might have complexities in their life, in terms of their personality or their psychopathology, and that makes establishing an alliance and maintaining that difficult. And it's also insufficient. So if I tell you to keep a good alliance all the time, that's useful, but what happens when the alliance breaks down and you're not collaborating well? What do you do? So we're going to explore that a little bit more today. Let's turn to alliance rupture and repair. Have you ever seen a young person look at you like this, like the image in this slide? Take a moment to think about that. And take a moment to think about what it made you feel like in the moment when they were looking at you like that. A moment to think about what you thought. And a moment to think about what you did, how you responded when you saw a young person looking at you. If you had your time again, would you respond in the same way or would you respond in a different way? So an alliance rupture is when there's a breakdown in the collaborative relationship between a young person and a clinician. So we spoke about the three elements, the bond, the task, the goals, and that's reflective of a good alliance. 
a rupture can be a breakdown in any of those components or multiple components where the collaborative work doesn't seem to be working anymore. And Safran and Moran, who are key theoreticians in the area, differentiate between two different types of ruptures. A confrontation rupture, that's where the client moves against the therapist, and a withdrawal rupture, that's when the client moves away from the therapist. So what would you notice when you see a confrontation rupture? One aspect of that, you might notice the client complaining about the therapy or the therapy activities. Why do you always ask me these questions every week? I'm sick of answering them. They might complain about the progress in therapy or the parameters of therapy. What's the point of coming along anymore? We've only got two sessions left. There's no point in me coming anymore. Or they might have make efforts to control the therapist. By contrast, a withdrawal rupture would look quite different. A client may, for example, become minimally responsive, which happens in young people often where they won't respond at all or they'll respond with one word answers. They might respond with avoidant storytelling. So an example from my PhD was the therapist says, does this happen often in your relationship? And the young person says, my iPhone battery keeps on running out. So they're moving kind of away from the therapeutic content in the way that the collaboration is breaking down. And being overly deferential can also contribute to an alliance rupture where there's no more working together collaboration. So Safran and Moran talk about alliance ruptures as partly being inevitable and partly arising out of contrasting human needs. So as we see here, on the one hand, we have an innate human need for relatedness. We want to be connected with people. We want to be belong, belonging to a group. We want to feel communion with others. By contrast, we also want agency. We want to be independent. We want to be separate from others. And we want to define ourselves as an individual. And in moving between these two dialectical needs, in a relational context, we can have inevitable ruptures. So sometimes we feel too close to others and we need to separate out. And sometimes we feel really isolated from others and we feel like we need more connection. And ruptures partly arise out of us moving in between these two needs. And what does this mean? So we can view the alliance as an unfolding process that arises out of the contributions of both the young person and the clinician and is negotiated by both parties. Alliance ruptures can also be viewed as enactments. So where there are relational patterns that play out in our lives, they can also play out in the therapeutic relationship and that can be useful as an opportunity for therapeutic change and growth. And so conceptually, we can think of these ruptures as opportunities for growth. And there's also evidence from a small meta-analysis that where ruptures are resolved, that does predict positive outcomes in therapy. So there is some evidence of that. Here's some figures just to show how alliance processes might play out over a number of sessions, with ratings being on the um, y-axis and sessions on the x-axis. We see in client A fairly good alliance throughout, client B a rupture early on and then some improvement, client C we see this pattern of rupture and repair throughout therapy, whereas client D has a more stable trajectory. And this is just to indicate that it can look different for every single young person that we work with. So let's turn to some tools for managing the alliance process. Firstly, alliance rupture and repair can be assisted by having a clear case conceptualization that incorporates an understanding of the young person's life experience, their current difficulties, their areas of strength, and their developmental period. By understanding the young person that's in front of us, we have an opportunity to differentiate between relatively minor ruptures that we can pretty much ignore or not attend to, or fairly significant ruptures where we need to really attend to it and work through it to be able to collaborate with that young person. And an example of that is that I, if I come late to a session with one young person, they might not care at all and they might walk straight into the session and jump into things. Whereas another young person might experience me being late as being hugely disrespectful for them or indicative that I don't like them and really need me to discuss why I was late or how it's impacted them. Here's a kind of typology model of how you might go about addressing ruptures. So there's surface approaches, which are more superficial, depth approaches, which explore ruptures in more detail, and there's direct approaches, which overtly acknowledge that a rupture has occurred, whereas indirect approaches don't acknowledge the rupture, but go about repairing it by indirect approaches by doing other things. 
So let me take, talk you through some examples. So a direct surface approach, as we see here, is providing a rationale or clarifying a misunderstanding. So the person, as we take the example earlier, says, why are you asking all these questions? And the clinician says, I'm asking all these questions because I need to get a better understanding of what's going on for you. Is it okay if I continue? So that's clarifying a misunderstanding. It's, it's direct, but it's also a surface approach. Whereas an indirect approach might be changing or reframing the meaning of tasks and goals. So this is resolving the rupture in an indirect way. So the, ther the client says something critical and the therapist says, how about we try doing a mindfulness exercise and move things sideways. A depth indirect approach is providing a new relational experience without overtly acknowledging the rupture. So for example, this is a young person who comes in really angry to session and is expressing a lot of that anger. And the clinician in response, the young person is expecting the clinician to respond in an angry way based on their past relational experiences. But the clinician responds in a curious way, in a warm way to that anger. And this provides a new relational experience without directly attending to the rupture that's going on. Finally, there's a direct depth approach. And this is using the rupture to explore a relational theme. So what's happening in the relationship? And this final one, the direct depth approach, is what I'm going to highlight and what I'm going to talk about in a little bit more detail before coming to another approach. One of the skills that underlies the direct depth approach is known as metacommunication. So that's talking about talking or communicating about communicating. And what you need to think of when you think about this is thinking about process over content. So the young person you're working with, something there's content of what you're discussing, but there's also a process of what is going on between the two of you. And here we see three different ways of metacommunicating. So the first one on the left is focusing on the patient's experience. So a rupture occurs and the clinician says, what are you feeling right now? Now, certain young people are very able to answer that question. Certain might not be able to, so you might need to help them, especially if they're developmentally younger. You might need to say, it seems like you're feeling angry right now. And that's allowing them to explore their experience of what's going on. By contrast, in the middle, we see focusing on the interpersonal field. So that's not simply focusing on what's going on for the young person, but it's focusing on what's going on in between you. And when exploring this, I find useful using metaphoric language. So we seem to be involved in some sort of dance. Sorry. So we seem to be involved in some sort of dance. What do you think's going on between us? Or another example might be, we seem to be in this tug of war. How's that feeling for you? So that's not focusing on the young person. It's taking responsibility and exploring it between the two of you. And finally, the last one and the most challenging for some clinicians is focusing on the therapist experience. So what might that look like? It might involve a question. So do you know how I'm feeling at the moment? Or it might involve a statement. When you say that, it makes me feel really mm. So an example, one of the easiest points to start with this if you've never done it before is to share positive experiences and positive emotions. So a young person might be telling you about an achievement they've made and you might say, do you know how I'm feeling when I hear about this? It makes me feel really excited for you. When sharing negative emotions, we need to be a little bit more judicious and careful in what we share, but we still can share negative emotions. And an example that comes to mind for me is when a client at times is sharing really traumatic experiences, some people do so while smiling and laughing in a kind of incongruent fashion. And a useful kind of intervention can be to say, do you know how I feel when I hear that? And allow them to guess or allow them to tell you. And you might be able to share in a genuine manner when I hear that, it makes me feel really sad for you. It sounds like it was a really hard experience. And use that as an opportunity to deepen your collaboration. So here's a model that was developed to offer uh, to understand this direct depth approach to resolving ruptures. We see the clinician actions in the green and the young person actions in the white. And I won't go through it in detail, but I want to make a couple of points. The first is that the first point is attending to the rupture. The first point of resolving a rupture is that the therapist needs to acknowledge and attend to the rupture being present. The second point is exploring the rupture experience and going through and understanding what's going on. And the final point is heading towards clarifying the wish or the need that's underlying the client's experience. 
So a client that's self-harming, for example, it can be a really challenging experience for us to see a client self-harm in front of us or to discuss self-harm. But oftentimes the underlying, clarif the underlying wish or need that can be explored can be really useful to understand. So is that self-harm so that they can feel contained and feel safe? Is that self-harm so that they can be recognised and be understood? Or is that self-harm because they need to feel connection with other people and they're not feeling other people? These are all wishes or needs that are perfectly valid and can be explored through this meta-communication process. A second model of rupture resolution is through cognitive analytic therapy or CAT model. And this was developed through empirical research and it involves again acknowledging the rupture and exploring the rupture. And the different aspect of this is that through the CAT model, the idea is to link what's happening in the rupture to the shared formulation of what's going on for the young person. And at times also to use that understanding to integrate feelings that might be warded off or hidden from the young person. So let's talk about an example of that just to see it come to life a little bit. So here's an example um, from a publication. On this slide, you'll see the rupture happening. So I'll give you a minute to have a read through it. So here we see a couple of rupture markers for the young person and what we notice is that they're disengaging, a kind of withdrawal rupture where they're being dismissive and they're also kind of saying I don't know and it seems like the collaboration has broken down to some extent. Let's turn to see what happens next to see that what the clinician says. I'll allow you to read through it again. So what the clinician does is first acknowledge the rupture and then spend some time exploring that. So exploring what happens when the client, the young person, switches off from their feelings and then linking that to the shared formulation, shared understanding. So the clinician says, I see how you switch off from feelings, that you can be articulate here, but you talk about in the outside world you switch off from feelings. So allowing the young person to kind of explore that together. And let's see how the young person responds on the next slide. I'll get you to read through it as well. So what we see here is what, what they call in the um, model negotiation. The young person is able to expand on this and say, yeah, I act like a digger from World War I. I shut off from my feelings. So use that exploration to explore what's happening for them. And the clinician asks the young person to expand, expand on that. So it's not something that you just do naturally. The young person says, yeah, they've reached some sort of consensus. And they use this exploration to go even beyond that. So the clinician says, do you think this has something to do with your anger as well? And the young person says, yeah, yes, in a kind of elevated tone of voice, suggesting that they've come to a sort of new understanding. And as we see here, so the client shut off, the clinicians responded constructively and helped them explore this kind of shutting off tendency. And they've made a link to show that sometimes when they do shut off from their emotions and shut off from everything, that their anger bubbles up. And in this way, use the rupture as an opportunity for therapeutic growth. So that's a direct depth approach and now we turn to this indirect surface approach which is a really different way of resolving ruptures but an equally valid one. And an example of this comes from a CBT or Cognitive Behavioural Therapy Model of Rupture Resolution which I'm showing here and this is from an empirical study of CBT sessions and it shows that when a rupture occurs the clinician initially reviews the rupture and what's happening internally and they change their approach and do so by summarising, exploring and validating. And they restore the collaborative relationship by encouraging the young person's participation, affirming the young person and seeking feedback to negotiate a new task in therapy. So what are we going to do next in therapy? What you'll notice here is that there is an indirect approach. It doesn't explicitly acknowledge that the rupture has occurred, but it allows the rupture to be used to move things forward in a way that's more coherent with what the client needs. So here again, the C's for clinician and the YP's for young person. I'll get you to read through this first slide. So 
So the clinician's asking the young person what gets them wound up, and the young person's responding with, hmm, hmm. There's not much therapeutic collaboration here happening. The, the, the clinician's doing all the work and the young person's doing nothing. So we would define this as a withdrawal rupture where the young person's moving away from the therapist. And let's see how the clinician responds. And we see it annotated on the right here. I'll get you to read through it. So rather than acknowledging the rupture, the clinician says, okay, which of those two do you think you would be easier to tackle? The young person responds, what would be easier? So they're changing their approach. And the clinician says, okay, shall we have a crack at prioritizing the interaction ones? So we call that encouraging active participation. So again here, the clinician has sensed that the rupture has occurred and moved things along to a place that's more coherent with the client's goals and the agreement on tasks of what they're doing and reestablish the alliance in this way. So these are two really different approaches. And now we're going to turn finally to what are the skills that you need to be able to apply these approaches in your own clinical practice. So the first is self-awareness. The capacity to be able to reflect on what's going on internally for you and what's happening within your emotional world. And this involves a change in attitude to some extent. So during therapy sessions or during engagements with young people, you're not supposed to be a robot and a professional and not feel everything. If you feel something, it's good to connect with that. It might have to do with you or it might have to do with what's going on between you and the young person. Secondly, affect regulation. When we experience a therapeutic engagement, it's possible that we'll feel strong negative emotions or that the young person we're working with will feel strong negative emotions and we need to develop the capacity to regulate those emotions and to tolerate negative emotions in the moment without being overwhelmed by them. And finally interpersonal sensitivity. The skillfulness to differentiate as we spoke about between what's a minor rupture and what's an important rupture and also the skillfulness to have difficult conversations in a way that attends to the young person's experience and doesn't overwhelm them. How do we develop these skills? There's some training models for resolving alliance ruptures and one of the models they use is mindfulness practice, using mindfulness to better reflect on our own experiences and to better tolerate negative experience in us. And the other approach in your clinical practice that I would recommend is experiential supervision and role play. So don't just talk about ruptures in a theoretical way, role play them out in supervision, individual supervision or group supervision, and practice what you would say, practice how you'd respond. And in that way, the emotions come alive and our responses and our ability to kind of improvise in the therapeutic interaction develops. Other skills to develop, Develop a case formulation of the young person's interpersonal issues. You need to get to know the person better over time in therapy. You need to take time to understand them. And hopefully if you're doing that, it should be easier to resolve ruptures later in therapy than it is early in therapy where you don't know the person. And if you are getting to know them better, you, you will be able to do that work more constructively together. Cater to a young person's developmental stage. So if they are a young teenager, they might need a lot more guidance to work through a rupture compared to a young adult. The ability to take responsibility for your part of ruptures is really important. So yesterday I was working clinically with someone and they had discussed a really difficult experience that had happened with them, with the death of a friend. And I went on to ask my next question, my next assessment question. And I thought to myself, I just didn't really respond in any kind of validating or empathizing way with this really difficult experience they've had. And so I said, I'm sorry, I just asked you another question and I didn't even listen properly and hear properly the pain that you were just talking to me about. And I apologize. And I think that's a really useful thing to do to show the young people we're working with that we can make mistakes and to not take the professional posture that we're perfect or that we don't make mistakes or that ruptures might not be because of our fallibilities as people. And finally, and this is the last point I'm going to talk about today, is an attitudinal change to view ruptures as opportunities. So we see here in this image jumping from cliff face to cliff face. When we view a rupture and we see that the collaboration has deteriorated, it can be a worrying thing. Hopefully what I've spoken to you about today is that ruptures are not only hurdles to overcome, but also opportunities to work constructively with the young people before us. 
So when we have a rupture, if we can look at that as an opportunity and bring that positivity to that rupture, we can engage in more meaningful and more deep therapeutic work with the young people that we're trying to help and try and achieve better outcomes for them. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your time and for listening today.